My parents were married 72 years before my dad was called into glory. Um, any, anybody in the building been married 72 years or 70 years or more? Anybody been married 70 years or more? I don't want to miss anybody, okay? Anybody been married 65 years? 65 years? Okay. Did I see somebody's hand go up right there? 65 years? 60 years. Anybody been married 60? Oh, uh, Dub and Nancy? Dub and Nancy? How long y'all been married, Dub and Nancy? 65 years. Y'all come down here a minute, will you? <clears throat> Anybody been married 65 or longer? Anybody married 65 or longer? Okay. Dub and Nancy Simpson are charter members of First Baptist Church in Indian Trail. And uh, we're just going to celebrate with him 65 years of uh, successful marriage here. It, it, it's good. It's good. Y'all didn't know this is going to happen, did you? Nancy, where, where did Dub propose? Or did you, maybe you ask him, but uh, uh, <laughs> where did he ask you to marry him? Where? Yeah. Oh, about uh, three miles away from here. Three miles from here. Got down on his knees. Did he now? He did. Okay. <laughs> And ask you to marry him. Now, where'd you go on your honeymoon? I went to Lancaster. Lancaster, <laughs> South Carolina. Hey, man. No, we, didn't, we didn't go on the honeymoon. They we couldn't wait very long, couldn't they? Right now. <laughs> no, that's where we went and got married. All right. How many kids you got? Three. Three children. How many grandchildren? Ten grandchildren. Oh, and Ten grand. will be 13 little great-grandchildren. Great. 13 great-grandchildren. Yeah. Hey, guys, put your hands together and just rejoice <laughs> with Dub and Nancy. Bless your heart. Hey, God bless you. And neither one never had a job in my life. <laughs> yeah, some of the hardest working people I've ever known. He said neither one has had a job, but I've watched them work many, many years. What, what's it going to take to stay married for 65 years? What's it going to take to have a successful marriage? 65 years, that's a long time. You know, marriage today is really, there's a lot of uh, stigmatism about marriage. There's a lot of question marks about marriage. We're trying to redefine marriage today. We're trying to reinvent marriage today. And uh, I, I can tell you, the only way that you're ever going to have a successful marriage is you got to figure out the fact that uh, God orchestrated marriage. He architecturally designed marriage. He put marriage together and he set a pattern out there. And the only way that you're ever going to be successful in that marital relationship is to go by God's pattern. So let, let's for a minute, I just maybe just for a little foundation. Um, you know, normally I'm verse by verse through a book of the Bible, but these last few weeks I, I've just really felt strongly impressed that uh, really this is where we needed to be uh, for two or three weeks just to, in talking about the home life and marriage itself. Look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 18. Genesis chapter 2 and uh, watch along with me at verse number 18. And the Lord said, it's not good that man should be alone, I'll make a help meet for him. Down to verse 21, Genesis 2, 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken from the man, taken out of man. I figured out when I was reading this passage some time ago that the reason men don't understand women is that they took a nap while, <laughs> while women were created, you know. We, we're, we're living in a tough time when people just don't understand marriage. Matter of fact, uh, there, there's just a lot of put downs, uh, especially uh, from men to women. It, it, it's amazing uh, in this day of skepticism, uh, for instance, phrases like, uh, I haven't uh, spoken to my wife in the last two years. And somebody said, why haven't you spoken to her in the last two years? Well, I didn't want to interrupt her, but you know, it's, it's phrases. <laughs> It's phrases like that, and I believe you'll say amen, women. It's phrases like that 
that uh, have really put a damper on the process that God would want us to be in in having a successful relationship. Uh, so if you're going to talk about marriage, then you have to talk about consideration. And you have to talk about a forfeiture of some rights uh, in your life. Now I want to spend just a few minutes, if we can, and, uh, and just talk about marriage for a little bit and some of the components that I am convinced have to go in to that relationship if that relationship is going to be successful. Uh, number one is an uncompromising devotion to the Lordship of Jesus. Now let me say it again. An uncompromising devotion to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You, you understand it all begins with both people being filled with love, being filled with the same Holy Spirit, and committed to the, with the same devotion to the Lord Jesus. May I say to you folks, you know, it's hard enough when you both love the Lord. It's hard enough when you're both filled with the Holy Spirit of God. It's hard enough when you have the same devotion to the Lord Jesus. Can you imagine what it'd be like if you didn't have those components already in the marriage? It's not going to make it. It's going to be a really a bitter fight to survive all the way uh, to the end. Now, understand that the most important component to seeing a successful marital relationship uh, is that a person's relationship to the Lord Jesus himself. You've heard of the closer principle, I know, and, and you've seen this probably many, many times before, but it's that man that's focused in on being the man God wants him to be and the woman that is focused in on being the woman that God wants her to be. Now watch what happens when that husband seeks to make Jesus the Lord of his life and the woman seeks to make uh, Jesus the head of her life, and we're supposed to have a little triangle. There it is right there. Watch what happens. As they move individually closer to God, notice what happens to their relationship. The closer the husband gets to God, the closer the wife gets to God, the closer they become. We're talking this morning about uh, a, a, a devotion to the lordship of Jesus. Jesus himself says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these other things will be added unto you. And that simply means that men, husbands, God has to be first in your life. Uh, above hunting and fishing and golf and other hobbies and your job, God has to be first. Uh, wives, God has to be first in your life, above everything else in your life. He must be number one. And, and, and God says, if that happens, then I will show you a marriage that is going to be fulfilling both to the husband and to the wife. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, uh, the Lord says, why, why, do you, why do you call me Lord? And yet you don't do the things that I have instructed you to do. How do you do that? Now, I want you to hang on to this one now, ready? You cannot name any wedge that may be wedged into a marital relationship that is not, first of all, a biblical problem. Now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm of old school. I think everybody that knows me knows that I'm a, I'm a throwback to a probably a former generation. I, I'm an old school preacher. And, and I'm so old school that I am convinced of this without, and you're not going to change my mind. I don't believe that there's such a thing as a marital problem. I don't believe in marital problems. I don't believe you have marital problems. I, I believe everything that we could name, every wedge that gets into a marital relationship is a spiritual problem. And it's when one or more or both of those people are not fulfilling the roles that God has assigned and outlined in the Word of God or they have allowed some spiritual impurity 
to come into their life. And unless that is repented of and turned away from, unless there is a spirit of brokenness that falls on the folks that are in that particular situation, that marriage is going to go down the tube. One of the biggest mistakes that I watch and I see in marriages today is that a woman, she kind of anticipates that this man is going to bring me joy. This man is going to bring me fulfillment. This man's going to bring me significance. This man's going to bring meaning and purpose into my life. And he looks at her and says that this woman is going to really bring into my relationship everything that is missing. She's going to bring me joy. She's going to bring me peace. She's going to bring me fulfillment. May I say to you that there is no human being on the face of the earth that can ever do that for you. Only Jesus can do that for you in your life. So forget about finding those things in another person. The Lord is supposed to do that. Number two, an unlimited commitment to cherishment. Uh, now we're talking about value here. We're talking about esteem here. We're talking about cherishing uh, that other person. Now, I, I grew up really in a very rough kind of culture. I, I grew up in a rough kind of setting when uh, men just did not view women in the proper perspective. Uh, see if you remember, some of you that are in, in my, well, the old lady. My old lady. I, I, that was referred to as the person's, the husband's wife. Or the wife, not a wife or my wife, the wife. Did y'all ever hear terms like that? had an uncle down in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, he and his wife were checking into the hotel. Porter came up and said, sir, can I carry your bag? And he says, no, she's just as healthy as I am. She can walk just as good. It's, it's, it's that kind of thing that we lose something here. We, we lose something here in the fact that we are to cherish our mate. It, it, it's amazing to me. How many people fall out of love the first year or year and a half of their marriage, they kind of let the fuzzy wuzzies go away. You understand what I'm talking about? They, they, they kind of lose the, the esteem that has taken place is gone from their relationship. Look with me, I know we've looked at this many times in the last couple of weeks, but look with me one more time to Ephesians chapter number five. Ephesians chapter five. And uh, I want you to see verse 28. The Bible says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. In other words, he carefully, meticulously, protects and values and places special emphasis and puts that special person on the pedestal there to love and to dedicate as something that is unique and special. I heard about an old boy came home early from work one day. And instead of just going on in, he thought, well, I'll, I'll just kind of surprise my wife a little bit. And so he goes to the front door and he rings the doorbell. And so she comes to the door and he's standing there with a bouquet of flowers in one hand and a box of chocolates in another. And he said, honey, I know I'm early, but uh, I came home today because I don't want you to have to cook supper this evening. Uh, we're going to go out. I'm going to take you out for dinner to a very nice restaurant tonight. Well, she was in utter amazement. She looks back at him. And, and with a very puzzled, angry, disappointed look. And she says, you know what? I've had a terrible day today. The toilet upstairs it stopped up and, and flooded and it just destroyed the, the, the bedroom below with water. The, the washing machine broke and it overflowed. And I had to call the plumber to come. The twins are sick in the bed. And here you show up drunk. There, there, there's just... <laughs> It's kind of a guy that you, you just thought, well, he, he, she wasn't having, used to having a husband that cherished her. 
and, and valued her. Now, how do we do that? Well, let, let me just say, your pastor is still a work in progress on some of this stuff. And I don't know that we ever arrive. But there's a couple of things that you can do. First of all, it's by the words that you choose. And it's also by the body language that you exhibit. It's a daily attempt to compliment and to adore and to hold in awe the most prized possession in your life. And you let them know daily that you are praying for them and lifting them up and that you love them with all of your heart. Number three. Boy, here's where we need work. And my hand goes up real early. It's an unflinching loyalty to godly communication. Now, there's a lot of communication in marriage, but not much of it is godly. Not much of it is holy. In USA Today, a, a few years ago, there was a little quip in there from, uh, you, you see those in, in the newspaper there periodically, there's a little quip in there from a, a woman who, who said, you know, my husband never hears anything that I ever say to him. Every day he's just got his head buried in the newspaper. So I, I got up the other morning and I said to him, well, today, honey, I, I just want you to know I'm going to be embalmed. And he just grunted. And, and, and she said, and then I'm going to be cremated. And, and my husband answered, well, what time? <laughs> it's stunning that he did not value enough to listen to her. Isn't it true? I, I think you'll agree with me that the majority of men and their communication with their wives really results in just some grunts and some moans and maybe some, well, wait till the commercial. That's kind of the way it is in our communication. Can I just say that communication is really one of the most important things in a marriage. When we are learning to communicate on the same page, on the same level, on the same subject matter at the same time. Every marriage, I'm convinced, needs to speak in tongues. Let me give you four of the tongues. Number one is a conservative tongue. Tongue. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19, the Bible says, Sin is not ended by the multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. You want to really stop an argument? There are a couple of ways, and here's one of them, is just hold your tongue. Don't, don't just get wordy all of the time. Number two is a non-combative tongue. In Proverbs 17, 14, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. And then third, there's a truthful tongue. Proverbs 12, 22, the Lord detests lying lips, but delights in men who are truthful. You can't have a marriage relationship without truth. You can't have trust without truth. You can't have a marriage without trust. And, and so he says, be truthful in your words. And then four is a gentle tongue. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1, you all know, the Bible says that it's there that a soft answer will turn away wrath. Communication. It's amazing to me. And here's, here's what's mind-boggling to me. And I, I think some of you women would probably say amen to what I'm about to say to you. Isn't it unbelievable that we men sometimes can be the nicest people on our jobs and we can be so gentle and kind and sweet and considerate to everybody around us when we're at work, but there's something that happens to us in our personality when the garage door goes up and we go into our house? Why is it that we can treat everybody in the world a whole lot better than we can the people that love us the most? Let me give you number four. It's an undivided attitude toward intimacy. An undivided attitude toward intimacy. Uh, 62 years, 65 years of marriage surviving because of unity and intimacy. Now, I'm not just talking about sexual intimacy here, but uh, intimacy, a closeness, a bond that exists in that marriage. And yet, even then, it is so difficult. It's so arduous. Would you agree with me this morning that 
emotionally men and women are different as daylight and dark? Two people agree with me there. You, you know, men have one thing on their mind, and that's accomplishment. But a woman has another thing on her mind. Hers is a process. And you understand, men, one thing, accomplishment. Women, one thing is the destination. We are as different as night and day. We, we think differently and forget that intimacy does not start in the bedroom, but it starts in our hearts. It starts in our prayer closet. It starts in our words and in our affection and in our touch and oftentimes just in a smile somewhere along the way. So much misunderstanding. One of the reasons is, is we, we all come from so many different backgrounds. And, and frankly, these kinds of subject matters were never discussed among families, much less in the pulpits uh, of the day when we were growing up. You got one partner that wants sex all of the time and you got another partner that does not want any interest in it whatsoever. Now understand something. We're not talking here about marital problems. We're talking here about spiritual problems. It's amazing to me. I heard about an old boy. He went to the doctor. He's very sick and the doctor did a complete examination on him while he was there. And when it was over, he, he, he let the husband stay in the lobby and he motioned for the wife to come back. And he talked to the wife for a little while. And he, and he said to, to the wife, he said, honey, I, I didn't say honey. He said, ma'am, um, I, I want you to know your husband is going to die and, and if, if you don't do some things to help him. And, and she said, well, what, what are you talking about? What do you want me to do? She, he, he, the doctor said, well... Every morning, you ought to get up every morning and fix a gourmet breakfast for him before he leaves to go to work. And then instead of him eating out in some of those fast food restaurants at lunch, uh, have, have a nice meal ready for him, prepared, uh, maybe a linen cloth uh, on the table, and, and just prepare a nice meal for him. Then when he comes home at night, I, I mean really blow it out every night, have a candelabra on the table, two or three different kinds of meat, ask him, you know, what, what kind of meat do you want for dinner tonight? And then after the dinner, don't, don't, don't let him be, get up and have to do a bunch of chores and say, take him into his chair and get him his slippers and the newspaper and and then before the evening is over, just tell him, darling, sex anytime is all right. Well, the wife got in the car and they were on their way home and the husband just, his curiosity got the best of him. And he said, honey, what did the doctor say to you when he took you back into that room? She looked back at him and she said, well, honey, he told me you were going to die. Look at, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 with me. Would you do that? 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 2. 1 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 7 and verse 2. Now, now watch what he says. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, in other words, uh, to, to, to put a, a hedge of protection around your marriage to keep from infidelity, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body but the husband and likewise also the husband hath not power over his body but the wife. Defraud or deny not one another except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your Lack of self-control. It's exactly what he says there. You see, the most vulnerable area of a man's life is to be tempted if deprivation occurs. Now, men, let me just say that there's a couple of passages that I would love to give you that maybe sometime you could pull out that passage and go to it and, and get on a stool maybe somewhere near your wife and just take the word of God and, and let it minister to her. Look at the Song of Solomon with me for a minute. The Song of Solomon. And I want you to look at chapter number 5. The Song of Solomon, chapter number 5. Now, 
Guys, here's something that would be ideal just to say to your wife, maybe on a daily, every day to her. Chapter 5, look at verse number 9, if you will. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? Can you imagine saying this now to your uh, to, to, to your wife. This, I, now I've said that wrong. This is the wife talking to her husband. Okay, this is something you could say to him. Um, what is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? Now, here's what she says. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as raven. His eyes are as the eyes of, by the way, this is the word of God, okay? His eyes are as the eyes of the doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with a barrel. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now, ladies, what is he talking about there? He's saying to the wives, wives, you ought to be bragging about your husband. Now, his belly may be lapped over his belt. He may be bald and all of that. But the Bible is giving us some principles here in the word of God that you are to brag about your husband. Now, husbands, what are you to say about your wife? Well, he gives us that example in chapter 7, beginning in verse number 1. Watch over it with me, will you? How beautiful are the feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. The joints of thy thighs are like jewels. The work of the hands of a cunning workman. Thy navel is like a round, oh, round. I, I don't know that I would probably say that to your wife. I, I'd, I'd probably kind of leave that one out. Which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like a heap. I, I don't know that I would probably say that one either. I, I wouldn't talk about her belly if I were you. Matter of fact, I'd probably skip over the next one too if, if I were you. Somebody needs to probably check the air. It's getting a little warm in this place. Well, why don't y'all just take the rest of it and read it when you get home? That would probably be the best thing to do. I'll read it. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. Thy neck is as a tower of ivory. Thy eyes like the fish pools in Heshbon by the gate of bath -Rabin. Thy nose, uh, you better not say nothing about her nose either. I, I really wouldn't compare it to the Tower of Lebanon either. But this is God's word, which looketh toward Damascus. Thine head upon thee is like Carmel, and, and the hair of thine head like purple. The king is held in the galleries. How fair and how pleasant art thou, O love for delights. This thy stature is like to the palm tree. Oh, Mm. Oh well, and thy breast to clusters of grapes. I, I said I will go up to the palm tree. <laughs> I will take. Okay, of the hold of the bows there, bows there. Now also thy breast shall be clusters of the vine and smell. I, I'm just going to stop at that point. But what is he talking about here? He, he's talking about intimacy in. The marriage relationship, and that's the only place that it belongs, exclusively inside the confines of that relationship. Now, let me give you number five, and I gladly move on to number five. It's an unlimited spirit of forgiveness. An unlimited spirit of forgiveness. This is the bedrock 
of the marriage relationship. I, I said this last week, and I want to say it again to you this week about what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is releasing the offender from the obligation to pay for their offense. And maybe we could even more personalize it, to pay you for the offense. Releasing the offender from the obligation to pay you for their offense. Now I'm not talking about acting as though that event or whatever it is you're trying to forgive, whatever the offense is, I'm not saying that you ought to act as if that it, it never happened. I'm not saying that you need to have an ostrich approach and just simply ignore it and pretend that it never occurred. That's not what I'm talking about. For, but forgiveness as a child of God comes when we release the offender, it's amazing, amazing, amazing how quick we are to really have our relationship to drift. I, uh, I found this yesterday. Uh, you've probably seen it, probably read it many times before. But it's, uh, it's really referring to how a man treats his wife the first seven years when his wife experiences a cold. I want you to watch the drifting in this. Okay, here's the first year of their marriage with a cold. You ready? The husband said, sugar dumpling, I'm really worried about my baby girl. You've got a bad sniffle and there's no telling about these things with all the strep that's going around. I'm putting you in the hospital this afternoon for a general checkup and a good rest. I know the food is lousy there, so I'll bring you some food. I've got it all worked out with the floor superintendent. Here's the second year cold. Listen, darling, I don't like the sound of that cough. Uh, I've called Dr. Miller to rush over here. Now you go to bed and let me take care of you. Third year cold. Maybe you better lie down, honey. Nothing like a little rest when you feel lousy. I'll bring you something. Maybe some canned chicken noodle soup. Fourth year cold. Now look, dear, be sensible. After you've fed the kids and washed the dishes and finished vacuuming, you better lie down. Fifth year cold. Why don't you take a couple of aspirin? Six year cold. If you just gargle or something instead of sitting around barking like a seal. <laughs> seventh year cold. For Pete's sake, stop sneezing. Are you trying to give me pneumonia? <laughs> Isn't it amazing how the gentleness just kind of wears off after time? You understand that the greatest need in most marriages today is the ability that only the grace of God can give to us to be able to forgive. It's the only way you're going to do it. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26, the Bible says, be sure you don't let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, solve the issues before you ever turn the light out at night. Now, now Kathy and I, we, we've kind of mastered this. Uh, I can't remember the last time we ever went to sleep angry. We, we've just made it a habit. We've learned over the course of uh, 48 years, we've learned that this is something that we're just going to do. We're just not going to go to sleep until we have solved the issues and fixed those problems. Don't let the sun... In other words, what, he, what, he's, what he's really warning is you make sure that you don't let the sun go down on your wrath because if you do, you're going to give a foothold to the devil to get into that relationship. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, be kind and compassionate toward one another, forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So there are the keys, I believe with all of my heart, to a successful marriage. I, I would probably, if I had time, I'd probably add another one. And we talked a whole lot about it last week and then a few weeks ago. And that is simply come to the place that you redirect your anger toward the real one who is trying to destroy your marriage. Because we don't war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness. Redirect your anger. It's a spiritual warfare. These are not marital problems. These are spiritual problems. I wonder if all of us would just stand together for a minute. Would you do that with me? Now, if you're not standing with your husband or your wife, 
uh, I, I'd love for you to do that for me this morning. Now, if you're, if you're not married, in other words, if you've never been married, uh, maybe you've been divorced, uh, maybe you're still single, maybe you're still teenagers or children here, th this is going to be an incredible event for you that I believe if, if you look at it in the right perspective, it's going to really bless your life. So, so here's what I'd like for the husbands and wives to do. I, I want you just to face each other for a minute. Would you do that? Join your hands together. Now, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. But if you can do it and really mean it, husbands, I want you to look at your wife dead in the eye for a minute. And I want you to repeat after me. And really make it your words, okay? I, and then put your name right there. Just say it out loud. I, and put your name right there. Continue to take you and call her name right there. To be my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. For richer, for poorer. For better, for worse to cleave unto thee and to thee only as long as we both shall live. Now, wives, I want you to look back at your husbands. I want you to do the same thing, okay? I put your name right there. Continue to take you and put his name right there as my wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forward, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, to cleave unto you and to you only as long as we both shall live. You may kiss your bride. Huh?